age of 17. Entron McRae, age 15. Harry Wise, 16. Raymond Santana, 14. Yusuf Salam, 15. Stephen Lopez, 15. Kevin Richardson, 14. Only Salam refused to make a videotape statement, but others implicated him. Any analysis of their claims of coercion is complicated. No recordings or transcripts were made of the hours of interrogation that led to the confessions. The best evidence may still be the tapes themselves. The first point of contention involves what the suspects say. Studies have shown that false confessions usually contain significant inconsistencies. In this case, there are several. The confessions differ as to who first grabbed the jogger as she ran. She fell first. Antron. You said that Kevin knocked her to the ground? He tripped her? Yeah. Question about who first raped the jogger? Kari Wise gives two answers. Who was the first person to have sex with her? Tape confessions are also inconsistent in describing who participated in the rape. Nor do any of them correctly describe the location of the attack on the jogger. Most are off by approximately a quarter mile. They do describe events that never happened. To give you a very simple example, uh, my client Carrie Weiss is alleged to have said that he took a knife and he cut uh, this young lady uh, several times. When her body um, was examined, however, there were no cuts that were consistent with uh, the cuts that he had described. Critics of the case say these inconsistencies demonstrate that the suspects weren't involved in the crime, that they are simply attempting to repeat details police want to hear. The second aspect of the tapes that has come under fire is the way in which the young men were questioned. Did prosecutors lead them into providing incriminating details? Stephen Drizzen analyzed portions of the confession tapes for us. This is a very significant moment in the interrogation. The prosecutor, Elizabeth Letterer, gives Carrie Wise a picture of the crime scene. Don't you look at that picture? Do you recognize that? And he says no, which is yet another indication that he does not know where this crime was committed. Letterer then shows Wise a different picture. If you look at that picture, and then look at this picture. He studies the picture, he studies the picture, and he can't give her what she wants. Um, you see him studying the pictures here. Let's see what he says about this. Great. Would you turn the picture that you're holding around and show me where you say that they grabbed her? What's interesting about this fake picture is she shows him a picture that has a police marker on it. And there's a number of police cars also in this picture. Is, that, is there a, an orange police marker there? Yes. Which way from that? Can you show me on the picture? Which way from that was she, excuse me, when she was taken? She goes straight down. And so that's one of the main problems of showing a suspect photographs of crime scenes during the interrogation is because you are contaminating the record and making it almost impossible later on to determine whether this is information that he is piecing together from the pictures or information that he knew already because he was part of the crime. Drissen also raises questions about the way Wise is interrogated about the beating of the jogger. There's one passage when the prosecutor asks him whether or not a you know, how the victim was struck. And he says that she was struck with fists. 
he, you didn't see him use a, any kind of a weapon. Did you see him use a stone or a brick? Ledwer questions Wise about the weapon again later in the interview. How did she get the injuries that she had when you finally saw her? I mean, you get, you get a punch, you see a fight, you get a punch, you get a bruise. You don't get, you don't get bleeding, you don't get these lines, you don't get a fractured skull. I'm more, I'm more, I'm more, I'm more, I'm more, I'm Within the space of 17 minutes, Wise had changed his story to neatly fit the physical evidence in the case. Critics of the case argue that, whether off-camera or on, intentionally or not, detectives conveyed information to the young men that they were then able to repeat. It becomes obvious that the interrogator wants the uh, child to say a specific thing and where the force of the law is coming down on these kids, uh, they end up caving under that kind of pressure. It happens. The sixth young man taken into custody that night was 15-year-old Stephen Lopez. He did make a videotaped statement, but he refused to say that he had been present at the rape, though several others said he was. You know, I'm telling you, I wasn't there. Okay. Unlike the other five, he would eventually be able to cut a deal with prosecutors. Without a confession, they were not confident of winning a guilty verdict. The other five suspects proceeded to trial. In the glare of a media spotlight as intense as any New York had ever seen. The atmosphere that the press helped create made it impossible for these kids to get a fair trial. April 21st, 1989, five teenagers were charged with a crime spree in New York City's Central Park. That included the rape and near-fatal beating of a female jogger. The details of the story shocked the city, numbed by years of increasing crime and violence. This crime, I think, staggered people's consciousness because of the size of the gang, the random viciousness, the idea that for 30 to 40 kids it would be sport to go into the park with weapons and beat people up just for the sake of beating them up. The day after the attacks, police learned that the victim of the rape was a 28-year-old investment banker named Trisha Miley. She lay in a coma in a New York hospital. To the public, her name would remain perhaps the best-kept secret in New York City. Her identity was generally withheld by the press. Beyond that, the media showed little restraint, and critics argue that the atmosphere they created was another example of the system gone wrong. The brutality of the crime provoked outrage across the city. That outrage and political pressure to solve the crime fed an aggressive prosecution and an equally aggressive media. The case of the Central Park jogger seemed to acquire a momentum all its own. We expect the media to always question the authorities, to question the police's version of events. And that's their instinct and that's their job. That's, that completely fell apart here. There was no skepticism among the media of the prosecution's case. In 1989, four daily newspapers were battling for their share of the city's readers. Two were tabloids notorious for outrageous headlines. Altogether, the city's papers and TV stations carried more than 400 stories on the case in the first two weeks. And you began to see these stories about... Um, uh, the, the, the operative word was wilding, because supposedly uh, one of the boys had explained to a policeman that, uh, well, we went wilding in the park. As many headlines as the story would eventually inspire, it provoked little in the way of investigative journalism. The kind that might have examined the way that the state was prosecuting the five defendants. I think they contributed to the atmosphere. Because from day one, almost everyone in the press believed they were guilty. 
and the momentum of believing these kids were guilty just overwhelmed everything else. On May 3rd, two weeks after the attack, New York headlines were dominated by a news story. The Central Park jogger had emerged from her coma. New Yorkers were treated to front-page stories about her remarkable recovery. But one thing she would not recover was any memory of the night she was assaulted. Because Trisha Miley could not identify her attackers, the videotape confessions became all the more crucial to the prosecution. The reason? The physical evidence in the case was far from conclusive. Police had not found any blood on the defendants that could be linked to the jogger, despite an extremely bloody crime scene. Hair found on the clothing of two of the defendants could not be linked to her either. The most potentially damaging evidence was semen recovered from the jogger and from one of her socks found at the crime scene. Samples were set out for DNA analysis, and in August, the results came back. Though DNA testing was not nearly as sophisticated as it would later become, the results were considered a devastating blow to the prosecution. First, the semen found in the jogger could not be identified conclusively. And second, the sample from the sock showed the presence of only one attacker, who could not have been any of the five defendants. You have five boys who are involved in a rape, and there is semen evidence found at the crime scene, and it doesn't match any one of them. That makes one wonder whether you have the right people. But prosecutors countered that none of the defendants had admitted to the rape themselves. So the test results could actually fit a scenario in which another attacker was still at large. We were certainly concerned when the DNA evidence came back and didn't match. Uh, but it was entirely consistent with the story, the stories that the young men had told that night. As major a development as the DNA may have been, there was one place where it caused scarcely a ripple. The media. By the time the DNA evidence fell apart, the momentum had already, was already set. And it was impossible to jump off this script. That script did not include another series of brutal crimes which otherwise might have dominated New York City's headlines in the summer of 89. Between June and August, just months after the Central Park jogger attack, 18-year-old Matias Reyes committed four rapes, stabbing one victim to death. One of his victims had been found with her hands tied in front of her face. Three had been beaten severely around the face, just like the jogger. All his attacks occurred on the Upper East Side, within a half mile of Central Park. Arrested in August, he confessed and eventually pleaded guilty to the murder and three of the rapes. As Reyes recounted at the time, his disturbing modus operandi involved the threat of blinding those victims. I picked up the knife, and I told her, because I was so nervous, I told you, I'll see you lying. And I shut the knife, and I caught her hair. This kid wanted to get a lot of stuff off his chest. Michael Sheehan, at the time an NYPD detective who'd also worked on the Central Park jogger case, interrogated Reyes. Is he a monster? Yeah, absolutely. Is he a, is he a madman? He's one of the five sickest people that I ever talked to in my life. That summer, Reyes was also implicated in a rape that had taken place in Central Park on April 17th, 1989, two days before the Central Park jogger attack. But for reasons that remain unclear, police did not pursue Reyes as a suspect in...